Sure, perfect evening here in Texas, and uh, we've got uh, scattered cirrus out there. And if you look off to the left, let's look into the southwest, and the cirrus is a lot more dense out in that direction. That's out towards Austin and San Antonio. And we'll take a look at the uh, satellite and kind of see what's going on. But out to the uh, north, it is uh, a lot more clear. And uh, yeah, beautiful evening, and uh, just a little bit of smoke from earlier today. Had a few uh, fires due to the. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't really think it's been that dry, but yeah, I, I have seen smoke here and there around the area. But uh, anyway, yeah, this is what it looks like, and uh, we're restarting the webcast because uh, earlier today I was replacing the CPU fan, and sometimes when we when I restart the computer here, not all of the drivers come up, and that's what happens. So. I'm probably going to have to set up a checklist for whenever the computer is restarted. But uh, yeah, I got the microphone working and I think we're good to go. So yeah, let's try again here. We've had fun with our practice uh, session and let's do the real thing. All right, so looks like we got a Pacific system moving through the Rockies and the desert southwest. And you can see the cold air up there in the northwestern U.S. And then out in Texas here, much warmer air. And you can see the ridging appearance. This is all due to dry air in the low and mid levels. So I can put a W here for the warm and the K for cold. So in between, that's typically where we find the cold front and it tends to lurk on the warm side of those boundaries. So that corresponds to pretty well in this area here, four corners all the way down to South California. And then up north around uh, the Dakotas and Iowa, warm front. And there's that. And just north of there, we've got clouds and some uh, low ceilings in the Minnesota area. And as you might imagine, if you bring the clouds north of all the fronts, it gives you a little bit of a comma shape. And that's often what we see there on the satellite. And not just that, but also that right there the uh, that that would be this here would be associated with some of the instability along the cold front and close to the low pressure area and you put that together and you get the classic um, bear clinic uh, cloud formation there and then another part of that cloud pattern would be the the uh, dry I guess you can call it the dry sector there on the back side and that tends to punch into the back of the system through here and that tends to be closely aligned with the jet. So we would expect to see probably a bit of a dry punch there in Nevada and Utah. Something like that right there. So that might be something we'll look at on the uh, satellite. So let's uh, take another look at that surface picture. There's that front there in Utah and Arizona. And out ahead of it, uh, there's the lee side troughing in Colorado, and that can be pretty significant with strong rocky mountain systems. We'll tend to get uh, mountain wave turbulence and very strong downslope winds from the Front Range into Denver, Colorado Springs, and Pueblo. 
And then here's that front we were talking about there in Iowa and Nebraska. And then up north, we've got polar air coming down out of Canada. This by itself would be a pretty good classic example of a Alberta clipper. Tends to show low pressure there in Saskatchewan or Alberta. And then along the tail end, we have got a new developing cold front. So if we give this a day or two, we could see that plunging southward into the U.S. However, I'm not too sure that's going to be the case. If we have a lot of troughing out to the west, that can put the brakes on these Alberta clippers and keep them kind of hung up up to the north. And then pretty nice day out on the east coast. You can see it's dominated by a huge high pressure system running from Quebec all the way down to Georgia. And then underneath that high pressure, 1033 millibars, a lot of clear skies, light winds, and maybe a bit of haze developing. Okay, let's take a look at the rest of the charts. There's the radar, not much going on, mostly focusing on some showery weather there from Seattle all the way down to Medford and Eureka. And it looks like we do have a few showers in North Texas. That's kind of surprising right there. I think we've got a short wave moving through the area. Pretty strong short wave. So we'll look for that on the charts. And this is probably mostly an upper level system. If we look at that thickness, not much sign of that. Maybe a little bit of troughing right here down at the surface, but this is mostly an upper level system. So let's see if we can go up to the upper levels and find that. I'm going to switch over to 500 millibars. And this is the current 500 millibar chart. This is about two hours ago. And we can see a little bit of directional turning there in Texas. So we're talking about if I draw streamlines, that kind of outlines a bit of a short wave maybe in this area right here. So typically out ahead of those short waves we get lifting motion. So we would expect to find that right there. That correlates pretty well with that radar feature there. And then if we take that down to 700, we might be able to see more evidence of that. Yep, also some directional turning there. And those uh, kinds of waves, those can be very important during the springtime, especially if they're smaller and more subtle. It's those really small waves that can be very important on tornado days. And as we get into spring, I'm going to try to show you a little bit more about that. But for the most part, this is more this is a larger scale wave moving through the area. Okay, we can see a little bit of that uh, cold front. It's not very strong. So I'm looking in this area right here. That's the main part of that front in the four corners area. And it looks like the tail end of that is not very strong at all. In fact, the potential temperature lines they kind of cross the cold front perpendicular. This is potential temperature. This is basically these these lines here indicate the temperature brought down to a thousand millibars, which is close to sea level. So in the four corners area, if we brought that down to near sea level, it would be about 26 degrees Celsius. That's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can kind of use this to eliminate the effects of elevation and get a better idea of the air mass. Uh, behavior through the Rockies and Great Basin and even the Northern Plains or the Great Plains itself. For example, Central Plains right here, that's showing the warm front. You can see up north of that warm front some pretty good packing of the potential temperature lines. And then south of that, yeah, there is a little bit of a gradient, but it tends to be parallel to the flow and this is what we tend to see with cold air or polar air that's gradually modifying and uh, dissipating there. So this isn't really too significant. It's really these tight gradients that are sort of parallel to, or yeah parallel to the front. That's what we look for on these analyses. I better take a look at chat and make sure we don't have any other problems. Before I do that, I'm going to bring up a, 
I'll bring up the southwestern U.S. view. Okay, switch over back to the chat. Pretty good crowd tonight. Uh, I pre appreciate everybody joining. And yeah, I saw your messages. Everybody, I saw your messages earlier. That's how I found out we were having audio problems on the last pass. But yeah, Mike Wan, thank you for the comment about the drone footage. Ron Chalfant saying much better. Ryan Toomey's mentioning the USGS data. California 4.0. Oh, is there an earthquake? I wonder if that's uh, related to that other earthquake in Alaska. I, I do notice that when we get those very strong earthquakes somewhere around the continent, there can be other activity elsewhere. And I'm thinking of, uh, I can't remember which earthquake it was. It might have been the Christchurch uh, New Zealand earthquake. I believe that when that got set off, there was uh, activity in Oklahoma that went off about 6 to 12 hours later. And I'm not sure if it was that particular big one, but it was somewhere around the world, and that woke me up there. We've had quite a bit of earthquake activity there in Oklahoma when I was there a few years ago. Okay, Rancho Font there in Trubeco Canyon near L.A., or you may be mentioning where the earthquake is. Mr. Manlet noticed a 5.8 off the California coast. Carl Burkhoff saying perfect. Thank you. Mike Wan. Uh, line of showers moving towards North Texas. Ron Chalfont using Quake Feed app. Brett Dean saying hello. 30 degrees there in southern Jersey. Two live feeds. Tornado warning near Sacramento, California. And Ron Chalfont caught that too. A little discussion about that uh, shortwave. Clint uh, Catalan, welcome to the uh, webcast. Skywarn, very good. Uh, hopefully we can get some more Skywarn people in here. And I will tell you this spring, I'm gearing things up to provide some extended coverage of severe weather. We're mostly going to focus on the Great Plains here. But when we get like a, at least a, a moderate risk day or high risk, we're going to focus on that and cover some analysis and even do hand analysis. We're going to do some of that. I'm going to have a table set up with a camera and we'll go over some of that stuff. Kodiak getting hundreds of aftershocks from Ron Chalfont reporting that. Uh, hello, Electric Dog and Brett Dean learning high and low pressure could trigger an earthquake. Um, and Carl Burkhoff saying, welcome. Okay. So we've had a cold front come through Arizona and Utah there and the uh, eastern California deserts. I don't see any sign of that really on this animation. We do have the north winds in southern uh, Nevada there. So this is probably outlining a little bit of a front. This is uh, a little bit earlier today. And then as with the day, the, as the night goes on and we go into tomorrow, looks like uh, some fairly mild cold air. Looks like temperatures warm up to the uh, mid to upper 30s there in the high deserts and 54 in Las Vegas. Let's take a look at the uh, southern plains. So in the southern plains, we've got the uh, very strong We've got some strong downslope flow starting to develop. And this is what it looked like earlier today. You can see the 20 knot winds coming out of the south. It's a very uh, dry flow. And then overnight, let's see here, we've got pretty much just uh, cyclogenesis there in Colorado with the uh, lee side troughing. And on out in the uh, southeast U.S., the remains of that old polar ridge that's gradually dissipating. So we're kind of in between and accordingly we get south wind. We're starting to open up the gulf and let's just run this uh, up through tomorrow see how the gulf looks. Let me scroll down a little bit. I'm seeing if the gulf is opening up. Looks like some strong easterly flow coming on shore. And we don't really tap that moisture very well until Wow, not really at all. It looks like uh, the flow comes around to the north on Saturday with that next front coming through. And you can see it right here. 
That's uh, some cold air coming in from Colorado and Kansas there. And we'll take a look up north at the uh, Midwest and the Central Plains. So we start out for with today, southerly flow, and there's that warm front there. In fact, the exact location at this time looks like it's about right there. You can see the temperature gradient between Lincoln and St. Louis and uh, Des Moines and Kansas City there. We go from 33 at Des Moines to 46 there at Kansas City. So overnight uh, the cold front's going to lift northward. You can see it right there entering uh, Iowa. Continued southerly flow through tomorrow, so a warm up into the 40s in Iowa and Illinois. And then we see a change coming up for Saturday. Looks like a cold front coming in from the west there. And you can see that sweeping from west to east during the day on Saturday and much colder air coming in from the uh, high plains there. Looks like a little bit of a warm up for Saturday and I can see some very cold air lurking up to the uh, northwest. These are teens and single digits up there in North Dakota late on Saturday. And this is the NAM, so this is about as far as that goes. But there's the uh, Arctic front right there, running from about Minneapolis to Pierre on uh, Saturday evening at about 7 p.m. there. So that's going to be one of the big changes coming up over the next week. Okay, let's see here. Um, I'll give you the temperature anomaly. This is a good way of looking at air masses. We've been covering this over the past few weeks here. And you can see that from Oklahoma in Kansas northward, conditions are uh, actually pretty warm. Climatologically, it's above normal there. And we really have to go up into the Northwest Territories and northern British Columbia to pick up the cold air. And looks like over Quebec, there's also a little bit of cold air affecting New England air, spreading southward down into uh, New York and touching New Jersey there. And down in Mexico, yeah, there is still some residual cold air coming up on the uh, west, the east coast there. And it's been pretty uh, cold season there in that part of Mexico. And then we can also see out in California, some of the cold air coming onshore. Got to remember that cold front, it's lurking somewhere in this area. And this chart actually kind of pins it down a little bit. I think we're looking at something like that for the frontal position. And then behind it, uh, some cold air in the San Joaquin Valley northward and very cold air up in the mountains, the Sierra Nevada right there. And that's telling me that there's probably a very steep lapse right there and conditions pretty unstable there in California. And uh, yeah, I was looking out in Texas and this is what the uh, satellite looked like earlier today. Pretty uh, quiet there, but when I zoomed in on Texas, you can see this uh, crisscrossing. These are all contrails from all the planes flying around this area. Relative humidities have been coming up in this region, up to about 60 or 70 percent, and that's what we need to lay down these contrails. And you remember that clip that we were showing when we were opening? You could look down to the south, and there's the uh, denser cirrus stratus seeing overcast conditions there in the San Antonio area and this is probably associated with the uh, subtropical jet probably lurking down to the south. So another way we can look at this is uh, this is that cloud field I'm talking about. We can look at the uh, NEM and look at uh, humidity and you can see we can also catch that short wave. Let me get the charts set up here. Okay, this is about right now, this is the 500 millibar relative humidity. This is about uh, 18,000 feet up in the atmosphere. And this is that little area of energy, some very strong upward motion working on the atmosphere. And also behind it, some very dry air following behind the wave. So we tend to think of short waves as producing upward motion, but there's also a, it, it kind of works as a couplet. We have 
the rising motion out ahead of it and the sinking motion back behind it. So we'll probably be able to see a little bit of that on the satellite there. If we go up a little bit higher, up to 300 millibars, it looks like this. And we pick up some of the higher relative humidities in eastern and north Texas, and that runs about 50 to 60 percent, and that's helping to give us those contrails that we're seeing. And then another way we can look at that is on the SKU-Ts. And of course, uh, yeah, half the battle is finding the SKU-T, and there it is. This is the uh, Fort Worth sounding for about two hours ago, showing a lot of dry air in the lower levels. Uh, there is a little bit of a moist layer at about 10,000 feet right there. And that's probably what we're seeing on that opening clip. Uh, maybe, you know, when you look up a little bit, up to about the cumulus layer, it looked a little bit kind of hazy in there. You don't need the air to be really saturated to produce clouds. There's, uh, You just have to reach what's called the uh, deliquescence point. We don't only have water vapor up those levels or in the atmosphere. We also have um, nuclei like uh, dust and sulfates and nitrates. And once you start getting up to about 70, 80, 90 percent approaching saturation, you can start developing kind of a haze. And that's kind of what we were seeing there. Looks like uh, as we were getting up to the 70% relative humidity up at 10,000 feet, we were developing a little bit of that haze layer, kind of a very shallow haze layer. And uh, that's what we saw in the clip. And then above that, this is uh, where, we, we, where we were seeing the contrails there. You can see very high humidity. This is up like almost 90% there. This is uh, good conditions for producing contrails. And then above that, we have the uh, stratosphere up in this layer here. Okay, so I think that pretty much covers that. You can see uh, also what looks like a low cloud formation working up the Rio Grande right there. This is that return flow coming up from the south. Very uh, modest return flow. And if we zoom in on that, we can see that this is comprised of what looks like uh, some stratus and stratocumulus. And looks like uh, some gravity waves in there. And uh, take a quick look out uh, west. This is earlier today again. You can see what looks like uh, a little bit of energy associated with that system moving through Nevada and Southern California. And then I was looking for that short wave. I think that's probably, that might be it right there. A little bit of a lift associated with that. And then an, probably a good way to see that upper level lift is to look at heights and vorticity. And that's going to be this chart right here. So this is up at about 18,000 feet. Uh, this is heights and vorticity. And this is the current chart. And you can see that short wave right there. So this is uh, 6 p.m. And then we advance it up to 9 p.m. And now it's crossing from about Childress to Abilene. And out ahead of it, that's where we, we're getting that lift associated with that short wave. So let me just bring up the uh, radar and see if I can find that. Okay, weather analysis, we'll bring up the radar. We'll do a radar site probably for Dias. That should give us a pretty good look at that. Okay, it wants to run flash. Okay, yeah, that's going to be a problem. I don't think I have flash on here. But that works. Okay, so yeah, this has the look of some elevated showers. So this runs from about uh, just west of Lawton down to about Graham and then southward towards uh, looks like around Eastland and Ranger. So this should be moving pretty quickly to the east and I don't think we can animate this but anyway yeah that will be heading for Dallas Fort Worth over the next uh, couple of hours and it's likely to just kind of gradually weaken 
since we're losing some of the instability with the loss of heating. Okay, this is probably a good time to take a look at the uh, satellite. This is when we typically look at the GO satellite. And let me bring that up. Okay, there it is. So this also shows that short wave. So that's going to be right around there. And if we look at the water vapor imagery, you can really see it there. There it is. So that it's actually located right about here. You've got to keep in mind that out ahead of that short wave, that's where we have the upward motion. And then behind it, that's where we have downward motion. And it looks like a very strong subsidence field back behind it, especially around uh, Abilene and Big Spring and Sweetwater. Very strong subsidence and downward motion being indicated back here. And if you're looking at a severe weather day, if you have moisture across this area, we would probably be thinking of the cap being strengthened in that area right there. So that could potentially shut down development if we have a dry line out in this area right here. Okay, a uh, quick look at uh, chat here. Ron Chalfant says, don't forget to click the like button. I appreciate that. Uh, I might have mentioned that already. Um, yeah, I probably did here. Mr. Manlet, 33 degrees at Rockford. Uh, Adam Davis says, I'm hoping to be a Patreon donor this year. Thank you. I, we definitely appreciate those donations, and it's helping to give us stuff like that drone footage. Electric Dog uh, saw a little bit of buffering. We haven't dropped any frames here. Don't forget the East Coast. Yeah, we'll try to cover that area when we have weather going on. Maybe we'll see some weather out there uh, later with that. We'll, we'll take a look at the GFS in a bit. Carl Burkhoff says, don't forget to like. You can really pick out the subtropical jet and Clint says, which I am. Okay, very good. So, yeah, there's the uh, subtropical jet action down to the south. And I'll see if I can bring up a chart for that. 200 millibar chart is good for pinpointing that jet. So up to the north, we've got, this is all mostly the polar front jet. And then the separate stream that we see down here, that's going to be the subtropical jet most likely. And you can see we've got about 60 to 80 knot winds in that area. And one thing that we can look at to help kind of nail that down, whether that's a polar front or subtropical jet, is to just go down to a lower layer. 500 millibars is good for that. And uh, one thing that you notice is that with that northerly jet that we have we drew out, you can definitely trace that at 500 millibars. But down in Texas, it doesn't uh, show up so well. Maybe a little bit of... Maybe a little bit of flow right there that could be kind of a hybrid jet, but typically if we see that wind flow die off down to about 10 to 20 knots or even lower, that's a very strong indicator that that would be a subtropical jet. And then another technique we can look at is to look at the skew tees. I can pull up Del Rio. And then what I do is I look at the depth of that jet over here on the right. And this kind of extends down so, yeah, that could be a little bit of polar front jet action there. Maybe a bit of a southern stream in place. So, I might call it that. Maybe a southern stream polar front jet in that area. And then I'll take a look at Shreveport here. Yep, Shreveport also showing consistency there. 40 knots at uh, 450 millibars and uh, 55, 60 knots at 30,000 feet there. Lots of dry air though in the mid-levels. Dew points running about 50 to 60 below zero Fahrenheit at 10 to 12,000 feet there at Shreveport. Okay, this is probably a good time to head into the forecast. We're looking for some polar air to be moving south. 
in probably uh, several days here. Now this is the 30,000 foot winds looking at the jet. You can see the main branch of the polar front jet right here. We start out uh, very zonal. We kind of alternate between troughs and ridges kind of like that. But then we see kind of a pattern shift as we get into February. We see higher amplitude ridges and troughs. It becomes much more merid meridional here towards the 30th. And we see the development of this polar vortex up in Canada. That thing really starts strengthening. And then as we get into the first and second, we've got a very strong northerly component developing aloft, which is going to push a lot of cold air southward, at least into the Midwest and Great Lakes area. And you can see that really come together around the 4th and 5th. There's that polar vortex, strong northerly flow, and then the other part of that is the strong ridging all the way up to Alaska. So it's not really a coincidence that when we get these cold polar outbreaks, we tend to get warm weather in Alaska, and that's due to this upper level ridge that builds up into that area. And yeah, it looks like that progressively strengthens towards mid-month, and by the 10th it looks like this. So this is pretty much a Polar Express coming southward. So let's uh, look at the forecast, and uh, I think what we'll do is we'll start with the European model. We don't really get to look at this too much, but there's the ECMWF. And this uh, only gives us pressure because the Europeans, they don't share very much of their data, unfortunately. However, you can see we're kind of divided between this outgoing high pressure area and this very stormy northwestern U.S. system. But this can give us uh, enough information to look at timing. And you can see a change here coming up for Saturday. Development of kind of a plateau high in Colorado. So that'll push probably our first cold front into Texas around Saturday. And then a bit of cold, cold polar action starting up in the uh, northern states. And that starts coming down Sunday. And then this piece here, that's the uh, plateau high. And then the cold polar high spreads southward through the weekend into Monday. And very strong ridging all the way down to Texas. So that's going to be the first outbreak. Seems like the European model going very strong with this compared to the GFS. And then this is outgoing. There goes all the polar air. We get pressure falls out to the west, so it's kind of recharging. That passes through and that dumps a little bit of snow. That helps develop some cold polar air. And then we recharge. And then this is Wednesday the 31st into Thursday the 1st. And then here comes the next shot of polar air coming in for late week. And that moves south pretty quick. Um, yeah, towards Friday, the 2nd and 3rd. And then we start recharging towards the 3rd and 4th. And then here comes another shot. So I think the European model is going a little bit more aggressive with a southern push. And I think that's uh, kind of surprising because it seems like the European model tends to be a little bit weaker with those southward pushes. The GFS is a little bit more aggressive bringing that cold air down. And then here's the GFS forecast. Let me switch over to the other product. There we go. So the forecast. High pressure in the eastern U.S. There's our low right there, extending all the way out to the Pacific. And our first system starts coming across the Rockies. And you can see it crossing into Colorado. Kind of a dry system, but it looks like it's emerging right here in Oklahoma on Saturday, early Saturday morning. And then behind it, that's going to be the plateau high air right here. And then this area up here, that's the main polar air up in that region. So let's see, extending forward, the Gulf is starting to open up in Texas, so it looks like a little bit of rain. 
And let's see here. Um, yeah, not very aggressive with this cold push. This is going to be Sunday the 28th. It looks like it is kind of in step there with the European model because that was bringing it down Sunday also. I think I'm missing some frames here. Let me see if I can reload that. Hang on a second. I'm missing, missing a bunch of frames in there from 84 to 120 hours. And uh, appears I'm all locked up here. Okay, it's just slow. So we'll bring that down and uh, take a look at the chat here. Getting some severe buffering. Yeah, dropping 3,900 frames. Yeah, we took a big hit a couple minutes ago. Yeah, two minutes ago we took a bit of a hit there and people reporting some buffering. I'll try to start you back off where we were. I think we were covering a bit of the European model there. The European model was bringing a very aggressive push of cold air southward. And that's kind of unusual for the European model. Usually it's the GFS that does that. So here's the GFS solution. There goes the uh, first push of cold air coming south. And this is mostly a push of plateau high air in that area right there. And then this is the main polar outbreak up to the north. So both of these are going to drive this front into Texas on the weekend. And there's the onshore flow there into Texas. And uh, the main push of cold air comes southward around Monday and Tuesday. This will be a 1040 millibar high going into the Great Lakes. And then this is the recharging phase. And then the next shot of cold air comes around Wednesday and Thursday. Very strong lee side troughing there in the Texas Panhandle. And then here's the leading edge of that next outbreak. This is on the first Thursday. And then we go into Friday and Saturday next week. There's that big blob of cold air coming south. Looks like a little bit of a northeastern U.S. system there. This is going to be on Friday going into Saturday. And then we start recharging for the next outbreak. This is going to be Saturday into Sunday, the 3rd and 4th. You can see that coming down. And then we get into the 4th and 5th. Very strong passage of that front all the way south into the 5th and 6th. And then we recharge once again. Alberta Clipper coming south on the 8th. And then we get a good strong push. This is a very strong. This is a 1062 millibar high coming south. We very rarely see that. And this is 360 hours out. So, you know, a lot could change between now and then. But if that actually pans out, that's going to go straight down all the way to Central America, most likely. And uh, we would likely see highs in the 30s in Texas and 20s and possibly even colder, depending on that air mass, uh, the condition it's in when it moves out of Canada. But as for the Midwest, Alberta Clipper right here, and that'll move eastward. Very strong system moving through the Great Lakes. So that's the way the fronts look uh, on the second to last frame. This is the 10th. And here comes that shot of cold air coming southward. Very strong uh, kick of high cold air coming south. And look how much it moved in 12 hours all the way from Texarkana. Actually, yeah, this is uh, what I was going to show you. This is uh, noon on the 9th. And then by midnight, it's moved all the way from Omaha all the way down to Texarkana. So, you know, if that pans out, that's going to be quite a strong cold blast there. So we'll just have to watch the charts. And uh, the European model is definitely going for some aggressive 
cold air coming south in February. And that'll definitely keep us busy here. Okay, uh, that's about all I got. Uh, oh, man, we lost a... I'm showing three viewers. We dropped a bunch more frames. Okay, yeah, sorry guys. I don't know if we're still on, but I'm showing three viewers. I think we took a really strong hit there. However, I'm not dropping any more frames. It may just be kind of... There may be some late latency there. But anyway, if anybody's still there, very strong push of cold air coming south. This is what I was showing here for the 10th and 11th with a 1060 high coming south out of Canada. So I'll go ahead and wrap this up. And uh, yeah, I'm going to take a look at the settings here. And I am going to be bringing in faster internet here, most likely. We've got an offer of 10 megabits upload. So that's going to make a huge difference there. And uh, if I get that set up, that might be for next week, most likely. Okay, that's about all I got for tonight. I appreciate you all watching, at least up till when we took that hit. Have a good evening, and we will see you tomorrow. Take care. <music>